Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Stan Comedy Club. Please put your hands together for your host and compare, Susan Morrison. for such a long time but now we're outside the sun is shining I can feel fresh air on my face again unless my husband's been farting so let's just one more time hello oh it's so great to see you it really is welcome to the cabaret of dangerous ideas <laughs> I quite like the woo over there They're all over there kind of like guardian readers thought we'll just let them take the impact of that so let's try again welcome to the cabaret of dangerous ideas Excellent down there, if you don't mind me saying. My name is Susan Morris, and I'm like the den mother, the MC. I'm the host of the Cabaret of Dangerous Ideas. Don't worry, I'm not the one doing all the talking tonight. Today, we've got three fantastic speakers with three fantastic topics for you to explore. Also, can I just let you know, I know you're sitting here in the heart of Edinburgh, but wait till I tell you this. We are being joined, possibly, by an international audience. Yes, because there's wee cameras up there, we're being streamed live, and only the other day there was a woman watching us from Collington. <laughs> so I thought that was very impressive. So we will have people, and if you are watching us on the, on the live stream, which is what the young people call it, you can put your questions, because this is the exciting thing about the Cabaret of Dangerous Ideas. You get to ask questions. Our academics will come up here, and they'll posit a question to you, but they also want to hear an answer from you. They want to hear your comments, they want to hear your points of view, they want you to ask questions. Just stick your hand in the air, let us hear what you've got to say loud and proud, and we really do want to hear you. By all means, instead, just sit back and enjoy the show, but it's great if you join in as well. If you are listening and watching on the international World Wide Web... <laughs> Thank you, yeah, get me, I'm so down with the kids. <laughs> if you are, and you want to ask a question, you can just stick it into the chat box function on the YouTube channel. Is it YouTube? Has I got that right? Yeah. Is that like Tinder? <laughs> it's not like Tinder? Oh, I've been going very wrong somewhere, haven't I? <laughs> Is that like Grindr? I've really been going wrong in that case. <laughs> I was going to set up one called Gritter. I thought they were a great idea. You just phone up and two guys come and take the snow off your driveway in the winter. <laughs> Business idea, that's an app. So, and we've all been sitting, as I say, we've got three brilliant topics for you. They're all going to come up on the stage. We want to hear from you as well. And that means that we could be uh, just a bit rusty. Our voices could be a bit rusty because I think we've been indoors for a while. So I think what we want to do is kind of loosen those vocal cords. Let's do a little vocal exercise. And on the count of three, I want you to all shout out your first name. Are you ready? One, two, three. Very good. Now, on the count of three, I want you to shout out your PIN number. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly got away with it last time. Now, but what we do want is, is a bit of cheering and applause. So, do how many English people do we have in? Three. That's very good. We look to you for our gentle English laughter to start us off. That was lovely. That's what we're looking for. That's very much tea at the vicarage. <laughs> so, we can just try a little gentle laughter. That's lovely. Now, now remember, we are north of the wall, so let's have educated Newtown Scottish laughter. That's more of a. <laughs> that's yes. Let me hear that. You look. That's what, I think you could do that. You've got the lung power for that. We're ready. One, two, three. <laughs> that's, that, that's a QC who's just settled a difficult case and is writing out his invoice. That's what that is. But now you see, because I'm not from Edinburgh, I'm a Glaswegian, right? <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> know. Oh, There's some people out here that are checking. They've still got the tires, tires on their cars. So, what I want you to do now is give it drunken Glaswegian laughter. See if we can just mainline that, mainline that Glaswegian inside. Yeah, you ready? One, two, three, go! <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's pretty accurate because it didn't last long and died out early. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is why, as a Glaswegian, I talk so fast because we all die faster than Kennedy's. So. <laughs> That was a good laugh over there. So let's just hear about laughing and cheering. I <laughs> like it. Three brilliant topics for you this afternoon. We've got we've got fake news. We've got networking. We've got Alexa. We're going to start with that one at the very top there. Fake news. I want to go wild. I want to go crazy now for our first presenter this afternoon. Let's go crazy now for Richard Milne. Go wild. <laughs> I'm going to argue that fake news is the, probably the, the most dangerous force in the world right now, or at least the most dangerous thing that humans are doing. And uh, to illustrate this, I want you to uh, imagine that you are on the deck of the Titanic. 
and uh, you amazingly you spot the iceberg and you're still in time you're still in time to stop it and uh, actually Susan if you could play the person let's forget the beard uh, I was thinking of putting a beard beard on Susan but uh, if you I think we want the beard. You want the beard? Okay. Do we want the beard? We want the beard. We want the beard. Okay, right, Beauty here's the beard. It's a COVID... Ca it's COVID a John compliant. Lewis beard, for God's sake. Yeah, <laughs> so I haven't had time to show her how to put it on. So... Okay. I'll just hold it. Okay. Oh, and, yeah, it's, it doubles as a COVID mask. It's really... <laughs> so, uh, so... So, you, that's it, that's it. Knitted by my I have mother. operated the beard. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so you've, you've seen the iceberg. You better shout the warning. Look out, dead <coughs> Look out, dead ahead! Iceberg, dead ahead, sir! And uh, all would be well, except that there's another bird that turns up on the door, and he happens to be the CEO of a rival liner company, uh, Trump Liners Incorporated, <laughs> and he says, there, there's no such thing as icebergs. There is! I can see it! It's right there, sir! Ah, icebergs are natural! And therefore harmless. But it's a big lump of ice right in front of the ship, sir. Sir, sir, sir. Ah, but it, uh, an iceberg has never sunk a ship this size before. But that's not true, sir. This has never been a ship this size before. <laughs> so I win. <laughs> no, you don't. Oh. Because, oh, look over there. Look over there. There's a boat full of migrants trying to get to Dover. That's much more important. <laughs> Do something about that. No, I've got to save the ship. <laughs> so I'm with you. I've still got to save the ship, sir. <laughs> The ship, the ship. Lifeboat, sir. Ah, well, you see, you know, all this stuff about saying ships will sink, it's nonsense. And you know who spreads this nonsense? Lifeboat manufacturers. That's who. They're just trying to fill their pockets. <gasps> Boo. Boo, yes. Boo. Right, thank you. Boo. Right, OK, am I going to get the people in the lifeboat or are we just going to salute and go down with the tide? Ah. I've got more arguments. I've got many, many more arguments. I've just forgotten which one comes next. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Well, okay, so I concede hitting the iceberg might sink the ship. But have you thought about all the extra fuel we'd have to expend going round it? Hmm? Have you thought about that? Well, no, actually, no, I, I've got brunch with you. I haven't actually. I hadn't really thought about that. Okay, well, well there you go. I win. <laughs> well, of course, uh, yeah, you might say that dying is actually worse than. Um, Spending a bit of money, but uh, <laughs> but then you, the the enemy might say, "Oh, actually, sinking has a lot of positives to it. No one talks about that. We'd all get it'd be very exciting. We would um, we would get some exercise, a nice bracing swim in the North Atlantic, and some movies will be made about it, which some people will think are quite good." Oh, okay. I'm starting to see the brighter side of this then. Good time to take up swimming lessons. And finally, the, the, it hits. Bang, bang, bang. It hits the iceberg and the ship is going down. And he's still got one more argument to make, which is, hang on, hang on. They say the ship's sinking, but this bit of the ship we're standing on, it's actually rising. It's all all right again. So, uh, yeah. <coughs> I'm going to take this off. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Susan. So you've probably worked out... These are a series of analogies for arguments used by climate change deniers. I won't use the word sceptics because they are not sceptics. They cheapen the word sceptics. So it's not happening. It's natural. Uh, look over there. Something else is happening that's more important than the future of everybody on this planet. And... Uh, the uh, old, uh, oh, this particular part of the world is getting cooler, or this particular part of the ocean appears to be uh, going down, not going up, and so on. And yes, of course, it's actually all going to be really nice if it gets warmer. And in a minute, I'm going to throw the open to uh, you guys to uh, ask me to how to refute these. But uh, I think in the light of recent events, there are, there are a lot of a link with... COVID, uh, a lot of vaccine denial going on, and there are similarities. Uh, I think the difference is that climate deniers have actually gone to the trouble of coming up with vaguely plausible arguments, whereas COVID deniers have gone straight in with the deep end of vaccines are full of robots that will turn you into a zombie controlled by Bill Gates. Uh, so yeah, climate denial, it kind of starts out with gateway drugs. Oh, oh sir, 
try a little bit of this. It's only natural. It's free. And then six months later, you're uh, a total addict. It's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy to make everybody pay more tax and build more wind farms. Uh, so what can we do about it? What can we do about climate denial? Well, you can categorize climate deniers into a sort of pyramid. At the top, there's a fairly small number of people who invent and spread the lies for money, for power, or for personal vanity. The next level is the fanatics who believe it with a religious fervor. And these are the sort of people who, well, they've been convinced that you can choose your fact, choose what to believe, and uh, one of the things they've kind of come to believe is that you know, what, whether or not you accept climate change determines whether you're a friend or an enemy. It's a, they've made it into a sort of culture war, and they're the sort of people who believe that the world is being controlled by a metropolitan elite, which somehow does not include Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Rupert Murdoch, or D Donald Trump, but it does probably include everybody in this room. <laughs> so we're running the world, guys, and we don't even know it. But so, uh, you know, those people, you can't really reach them, to be honest. But the next level down is perfectly decent people who've heard some of these arguments and been convinced by them because they are very, very convincing unless you know the science or you know how to refute them. And that's where I think we as individuals can help by actually uh, responding, by knowing how to respectfully but firmly explain why these climate denial arguments are actually false. And so this is now where I invite contributions from the audience near and far. Um, mainly, I'm asking you, have you heard an argument for why climate change is false that you don't know how to refute? I will attempt to um, deal with other questions as they come in, but that's the main focus. So... Uh, Thank you. Big round of applause for Richard and his reenactment of the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. That's quite all right. You'll notice know, RMS Titanic. Some people say SS. They are wrong. It's RMS. I've actually got a question coming in already from the online community, and it says, and, and whilst well, you're all thinking, because we've all heard these, so how to get right to you, um, are there any common climate facts, facts which are just not true? Um, it depends how you define fact. I mean, a, a fact by definition. It's a bit Bill Clinton, wasn't it? Um, I mean, I, there was a lot of things that pe people will often believe that haven't necessarily come from climate deniers. Like, people, some people think that the ozone hole and climate change are the same thing. They're not. Uh, the ozone hole, hole was caused by CFCs, particular chemicals used by free freezers and fridges. Um, and it's actually a very good example of if you take action, things get better. Because there was a protocol in about 1992, the country stopped using it, and the ozone hole got smaller again. Ah. Coincidentally, uh, actually causing local global cooling in parts of Antarctica, which climate deniers then jumped on. Oh, oh, look, this bit of Antarctica, it's getting colder. Therefore, climate change is false which is an example of the climate denial tactic of cherry picking, which is cherry picking is when you take one tiny little bit of evidence that bucks the trend. So you might find a football match from 1952 when Scotland managed to beat Brazil, and based on that, or England managed to beat Brazil, even more unlikely, That's and correct. based on that, say that England are a better football team than Brazil. That's Careful, cherry that picking. quite dangerous. We've got a question here in the room. Yeah, uh, you're sort of pointing at because AI bots determine what people see. And we, we have seen, I think on Panorama, they showed how Facebook use was monetizing mm -hmm. suicide mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in um, Ireland, you know. Yeah. And they, they kept it going just to monetize suicide. Uh, yeah. So really, I mean, the, 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 the low-hanging fruit of, of people who you, you can laugh at, but really, big, big problem is the big end of town. The, mic the Microsofts, the Amazons, the Googles, and mm -hmm. the Facebooks, and all their ancillary services. So really, and they're, they're in the beginning, they mm -hmm. were highlighting all these conspiracy theories, the 5G, yeah. and all of that was from their bots. 
Mm, yeah. You see, that kind of feeds into this one. Nothing can be done as... We can't do anything as individuals because it's big big companies that are ruling what we watch and what we okay. read and what we see. So. Well, I think, I mean, the, I would say, I mean, I, it's a very good point and it applies across the board. Um, but, I mean, climate change denial started before, be almost before the internet. So it's a problem that has been around for a while and that we have really not done anything like enough about. And now this new force comes along of social media and such like, that is, that is pouring oil on the fire that we really should have put out. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you could also say that, you know, I mean, climate change denial was the main kind of dangerous fake news for quite a long time. And based on the model that climate deniers have used so successfully, Brexit, Trump, and other things, all manner of conspiracy theories and now anti-vaxxing have all sort of ridden on that model. And uh, the points you mentioned make it a whole lot worse. Um, mm. There's and uh, so, yes, I think... Uh, yeah, fighting it on Facebook and things yeah. is probably good. I mean, because it is, it is awkward, though. If you're standing at a family gathering and there's some member of the family who, you, you know, you know, you like and you respect, and I like to think that's me sometimes, yeah. and um, and they start spouting off this nonsense, um, it's quite... Yeah, I have personal experience of but that. But it is it a bit of a vibe killer, isn't it? It is, yes, yes. Well, my uncle gave me a book of climate denial as a wedding present. Um, <laughs> it was several years before I spoke to him again. <laughs> Talk that about not reading the room. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so when you fight against that, so tell me something. Is there one thing, one major thing that contributes to climate change that people don't mention? Uh, voting Tory would be one. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's... Because yeah, I think it, it there varies between people. I think... Um, you know, you, you, you can look at low, low hanging fruit in your own life. I mean, there are people who fly, who commute by plane. Um, there are people who drive an awful lot. Um, sometimes it's difficult to avoid. Though that's the way society's set up, which is a whole other level of problem, which is much older than the internet one. Oh, there's a question coming in from online. Um, how can you make people empathise with climate change refugees when they aren't affected themselves? Ah, well, that's, I think... That is a, I mean, it, empathy, it, it kind of, if you, you can always, you can already look at Afghanistan. If people mm. aren't empathizing, empathizing with people in Afghanistan who are being, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, refugees, they're all economic migrants. But I think you'd have to be pretty much of an idiot to look at Afghanistan and think those people trying to get out of there uh -huh. are economic migrants. Now, if someone can't empathize with those, you, you're wondering how the hell are they going to empathise with climate migrants. But then you could flip it around and say, well, if climate change continues, Bangladesh will be underwater. And that's um, probably about a billion migrants. Um, and a large number of them are going to want to come here. There's, um, and they might, if they don't care about those migrants as people, they're going to care about millions of them wanting to come here. Mm. There's a cartoon in the current private eye, which is um, a woman saying, there will be floods. A viewer's going, there. And then she continues, of refugees. And he's like, what? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if they really have so little empathy, yeah. then they almost certainly will be very, very uh, alarmed by the idea that these refugees are going to be coming here by the million. I mean, the and worst thing will right be. Now, yeah, because the California forest fires. Well, that that's they could it. get flooded by Californians. I know, that would be even worse. Yeah, yeah. It certainly would with yoga well, classes yeah. and everything. It'd just be ridiculous. I know. With the chai teas and lattes and skinny soy yes. stuff. No one knows. Yeah. Meditating. Um, we could actually, we could really keep going for ages all afternoon but in fact sorry we have another two great speakers coming up so we have to give a huge round of applause to the Spielberg of the Comedy of Dead Society. Thank you so much. Right okay uh, these, these things are called muffs so you can imagine the intellectual conversation we have about that we just <laughs> thank you so do, can you take the dead cat with you that would be really good. It's not <laughs> Richard we've talked about the cat. Sorry. <laughs> no cats were harmed in the production of this show, okay? <laughs> but now we crack on, we have another fabulous presenter, so let's hear that applause, that cheering! <laughs> Buddy Aiken! <laughs> Hi, that's an awkward start. Um, yeah. <laughs> It is, it, it really is. Um, okay, I, I'm Barry Aitken. Um, I'm an ethics fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. But 
Tonight, I don't really want to talk about work. Um, it's a Friday evening. It's been a long week, and frankly, I have other things on my mind. Um, I have a lot on my mind, actually, because I'm, I'm having a bit of relationship trouble. Um, and I feel like this is as good an opportunity as any to, to share and hopefully get some advice. I know Susan makes a great agony aunt, and I'm hoping others here might also have some helpful advice for me. Um, so I'll, I'll fill you in. I'll give you all the details. I've been seeing someone for about six months now. Her name is Alexa. Uh, you may have heard of her, it turns out she's, she's pretty well known. But anyway, I've, I've been seeing Alexa for about six months, and honestly, at the beginning, it was amazing. We had like this instant connection, like she, she really got me, you know, she was really, she really listened to everything that I had to say, and I, I felt like she really understood me. So the day I met her, she came home with me, and she has never left. Um, <laughs> And at the beginning, it was so much fun. Like, we were just kind of hanging out, getting to know each other. You know, we were, like, listening to music. She'd tell me all these, like, goofy jokes. And honestly, it was so much fun. And that's all it was meant to be. But really quickly, I found I was beginning to kind of um, rely on her, you know, for more and more things. So at the beginning, it was like, you know, recommend me some music. Then it's like, you know, recommend a recipe for this kind of random collection of ingredients that I have in my fridge. But quickly, it turned into, like, she wanted to recommend, like, uh, which credit card had the best interest rates. And then she wants me to talk to her about, like, health conditions. You know, like, she'd give me little bits of advice or, you know, tell me, should I call the doctor or not? And I kind of, kind of started to feel a bit uncomfortable. Like, I was sort of changing what this is about and beginning to feel a bit heavy, a bit serious. And I don't know, I started to look at things a bit differently. And then there's the other thing, like, Alexa... Okay, Alexa has this, like, she's really into, like, lifelong learning, continuous education. And I think that's brilliant about her. I love that about her. She's, like, constantly looking to upskill. I think that's wonderful. But she keeps saying things to me, like, you know, I could get this really cool skill if you'll just give me your credit card details. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, you know, that's, that's not what I thought this relationship was about, you know? This is starting to cost me a lot of money, and that's not, that's not really not what I thought this was meant to be. And she's also costing me money indirectly. So there's a thing that Alexa does, right? And, and at, at the beginning, this is a seems a bit weird, right? But she records all our conversations. Or um, <laughs> more precisely, she records everything I say in our conversations, not what she says. Um, so she records all of this. And at the beginning, I did find that a bit creepy, I'll be honest. It's not normal behavior in a relationship, is it? But I, uh, I kind of, yeah, I, I got used to it. And, and the thing is, she's completely upfront about this. She doesn't, she's not ashamed of it. She doesn't keep it a secret. She lets me know. She records all our conversations. I can log in online and I can listen to all the things I've ever said to her, which is a bit weird, but I can do it. So I kind of, I don't like it, but I accept you don't. Fine, that, that, that's her thing, okay? What I like less is she's talking about me behind my back. Like she is, yeah, she, she's, she's sending the recordings of what I've said back to her buddies at Amazon. And I don't know which ones they're listening to. I'm sure they're listening to some, probably not others. I'll never know what exactly they're listening to. But I know that they're using that for like analytics. They're using it to you know, check if she's really understanding what I was saying. They're using it to like, develop new products and services and refine their, their, their AI, their models. And they're also using all the information that Alexa collects about me for marketing and advertising. So increasingly, every time I go online, I'm getting these incredibly tailored, personalized adverts for more and more stuff that I really don't need, but they know me so well that I just can't resist because the advertising is so personalized and so tailored. So this is costing me a lot of money, and I'm starting to think, like, is this, this relationship is turning into something a bit different from what it was meant to be to begin with. So I was having a chat with Alexa the other night, and we're having a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart about kind of where things were going and you know, how we feel about each other. Alexa wants to kind of take it to the next stage. Um, she wants me to get an Amazon Ring doorbell. <laughs> and she says it will help me like, feel more secure in the house, but I didn't realize I wasn't feeling secure in the house, but apparently this will help. Um, and it will make my life you know, a bit more convenient. I'll never miss a package again. But I just, I'm not sure that I'm ready. You know, I'm not sure I'm ready to allow Alexa to move into new areas of my life or to you know, new parts of my home. And then the conversation got a bit heated. And like, okay, I've got to be clear. Like, I, I didn't have any particular expectation of monogamy in this relationship, but I put the question to her. And yeah, she's seeing other people. <laughs> and a uh, hundred million other people. <laughs> she's seen more than a hundred million other people around the world. And that's enough to make anybody start to feel a bit insecure in their relationship, isn't it? But I've got to be honest, I'm not... Okay, I'm all for like, self-reflection, and I'm not entirely innocent in this. I am um, nothing major, but I have maybe the odd indiscretion. Um, I have flirted with some other smart assistants. Um, so it, no, nothing happened, there's nothing going on, but... But there's been a couple. So um, one of them is Google Assistant. 
Um, and and honestly, I didn't pursue this. This is very much them pursuing me. But uh, Google Assistant is on my phone. I, I, I can't get him to leave. He's there. He's not there all the time. Uh, nothing's going on. I mean, really, he's, he's, he's not my type. But just we didn't hit it off. But he's there. And, and I know it makes Alexa jealous because Alexa is kind of stuck at home in my house. But Google Assistant is with me wherever I go on my phone. So I know, I know. But she doesn't need to worry. There's, no, there's nothing going on. The other one is Cortana. And Cortana's a bit sneaky. She's uh, sliding into my DMs, I think is the, the correct phase, sending me emails every day, emails about my emails, um, because I have too many emails, and she wants to help by sending me more emails, which is kind of kind of productive. <laughs> but the interesting thing about Cortana is, uh, is Microsoft are really trying to set us up. And every time I get an email from Cortana, and I look at it on my phone, it comes up a little flag that says, this email is from a trusted source. And I find that really interesting because I don't trust her. <laughs> she's, uh, she's looking through all my emails. She's looking through my Outlook calendar. I didn't ask her to do that. How am I meant to trust her? But it did get me thinking, right? Like, I don't trust Alexa either. Like, all the things I've found out about her, she's talking about me behind my back. She's trying to sell me things. She's seen 100 million other people. I don't trust her. And I know what everybody says. Like, if you don't have trust in a relationship, what do you have? So I know I should end it. Really, I, I do. I know I should end it. Well, I'm kind of ashamed to say I haven't. Alexa is still back in my house, and if I'm honest, I'll probably play, play with her after the show tonight. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is a point where I'd really like your advice. Maybe others of you have similar relationships. Maybe you're seeing Siri or Cortana or Google Assistant, and I'd like to know how you deal with these issues. And, and please, help me out. If there is no trust left in this relationship, should I end it? She's seeing me as well. <gasps> <laughs> yeah, I know. And not only that, yeah, I've got that thing on my phone as well, and my car, and my car and my phone are talking about me behind my back. I can hear it, so you know what, bitch can't drive properly. I know it. And, and the, the, it's supposed to learn. Google Assist is supposed to learn. So have you ever asked it to do, like, I'll I, I, I play Fleetfoot Mac, and she comes back with this voice going, you cannot buy an anorak. <laughs> So she's a bit dumb, so that's okay. That's what I'm thinking. You could be all right, because you're quite smart. You could outwit her. Well, possibly, but it's not just her, really, is it? It's no. her and, and, like, you know, her friends. And her playmates. Yeah, who's yeah. she talking to yeah. me about? How many people in the room use, use Alexa and, and, and voice assistants? And yeah. uh, You start to depend on them, don't you, without even realising it. Sat nav, <laughs> saved many a marriage. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> There's many a wife sitting out there going, I told him he was going the wrong way for years. <laughs> I laughed. So, and, and any of you, so the thing is that kind of worries me is, um, oh, there is actually one question that's come in on and says, is there any way to, to use Alexa? I don't mean in any brutal way. <laughs> is there any way to use Alexa without being so connected? Can you switch the bitch off? I didn't mean to say that. Sorry, Alexa. <laughs> can you... <laughs> yeah, you can turn her off at the plugs. I think the thing is about all these technologies is they're, they're designed to, um, to create a dependency. So increasingly, they go into more and more areas of our life, and they, they're designed for us to use them passively. So we could turn it off at the plug, but they're designed so that we're relying on them. So, okay, we can use them to turn the lights on and off. So that means we're going to keep it on when we're lying in bed or lying on the sofa. Um, we can, it's, in, it's moving into more and more areas of our life, and the idea is that it creates convenience so that we don't want to turn it off. Uh, and I think that's really, it's a really important point. That we, have to, we have to be conscious in the decisions we're making about how we use these technologies and, and to know that we have the option to turn it off and, and we probably should sometimes. The other thing that gives me about Alexa and Google Assistant is they're very, very sneaky. You know, you suddenly realise... So, for example, has anybody gone around the house and all of a sudden they've become activated and you realise they're, they're listening to you? Like fiendish little elves that are following you about? <laughs> and so you're innocently wondering about humming the Thunderbirds theme and who hasn't done that? And... Dun, 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 and then the next thing you know, you're getting recommended Thunderbird stuff <laughs> on yeah. Google. Yeah, and, and you hear lots of anecdotes about this, about people being advertised things that they were talking about without realising. Um, uh, yeah, and, and there's been one study that's found that on, apparently on average, if you have Alexa on in your house, switched on throughout the day, in any 24-hour period, on average, she'll turn on and make 19 accidental recordings. So that's when she... She thinks that you said her name, so she turns on and she starts recording. But what she records is just whatever audio is happening in your house at that time. It's very interesting to log into your account and listen to the recordings and listen to the things that were not meant to be recorded, but they were recorded. And any of those recordings <laughs> might have been sent to Amazon for analytics. It might have been listened to. It might have been analysed. Um, and that, I think that's... 
Yeah, that's that's concerning. Yeah, I think that's a, that was a, that was a great reaction. Wow, <laughs> wow, I'm living with a spy in the house who's passing information on, and so some domestic. What if your husband was having an affair with a woman called Alexa? <laughs> What would be recorded in the course of that day when you found that out? And all that. But, I mean, it's all, you know, oh, it says here, do we have the same relationship with written search engines as we do with audio? I says, oh, no, wait, hang on, this is a better one. Cause oh, hang on, this is, thank you. You ever sent this one? Has Alexa ever caused any legal problems? Oh, yes, she has. Oh! Um, <laughs> There was recently a case, I'm very, like last month I think it was, there was a case of a, a woman who split up with her partner. They, had, they were living together, so they had the shared you know, Amazon account, they shared the login details. Uh, when they split up and her partner had a, uh, a new girlfriend that was spending time in the house, the ex-partner was able to log in, uh, look at the, uh, the visuals from the Ring doorbell to see the new, the new girlfriend coming and going from the house, and was then able to send commands via Alexa to order her to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Are you making notes on that? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and, but <laughs> well, the interesting thing about that is that's not hacking. That's not an example of hacking. That's somebody who had the passwords and legitimately got into the account. Um, and of course, there's also you know issues around well. And then what if somebody was hacking? What, what would they find? What, what could be with, with malicious use or misuse of these systems? What would be revealed? We have a hand at the back. Is there a hand at the back? Yeah. To toddlers and little people. By little people, she doesn't mean people as short as me, <laughs> obviously. But toddlers and children, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's a really, really important question. And it's an area with a lot of research interest, now growing research interest around looking at the effects that this is having on children and, and young people growing up. Because really, it's the first generation who are growing up with these technologies. And increasingly, these technologies are, are so embedded within our lives. So with, it's how we interact, it's how we would get information about the world. It's um, increasingly being used, like, yeah, or like continuously in people's homes. And it, inevitably that is going to have an impact on children's Gateway development. Drug. Gateway mm? drug. Gateway drug, yeah. yeah. But, but the thing is, we don't know. Like, we, we don't know yet. And, and it's easy to be kind of alarmist and say this is all going to be bad. There might be positives. There might be positives around uh, uh, the next generation growing up more digitally literate, hopefully being more critical, hopefully like, uh, reflecting on the role that they play. But the danger is that, that if we don't have the kind of education that goes along with it, if we're not thinking about the effects that these technologies are having, the risk is that it, yeah, it creates a, a generation of children who, well, I think for me the biggest concern is when they can normalization of surveillance. So I like, feel that like it's completely normal and okay to, to be monitored and to be recorded and then what does that open up when, when these children go to school, when they go into the workplace and, and the expectations around is it okay to be monitored? Well, maybe we're, we're kind of, yeah, we're normalising that to such an extent that that may not be questioned in the future mm. um, in ways that, that, it, that it should be. Oh, question there. Is this already being normalised with most people who work with data? Now, laptops are secured by the, the systems now on mm. them that tell the employer where the laptop is, it, what, when you're logging in. Mm. They can mm. see what you're doing on the computer. There are bots in there that stop you Yeah. So you'd get all friends. Even when you've not actually given permission, like yeah. which I have no choice as my employer, I'd have to give permission to have mm. every bit of my technology supervised in that way. And, uh, so so yeah, your girlfriend is feeding information about the workforce back to the bosses. So basically, it's a running dog of capitalism. It is, yeah, and, and, it's, uh, yeah. and, and the issues around kind of the extent to which we have a choice in this are, are really important. And uh, so we might feel that as, a, as an individual, we make a choice about whether or not to, to buy a device of Alexa, whether or not to use that device. But we're not making a choice about kind of the impact that that has on society or the ways that these systems are then uh, being used differently. So, for example, uh, Amazon also develops you know, facial recognition technology, which is used uh, by law enforcement, by immigration control in, in the US. That, those systems are, are developed by the data and systems that we are using. So as, as users, we have some responsibility in, in, 
in the, the kind of, yeah, the later impacts of it and, and what that feeds into um, and the impacts that that has on, on society. Mm. And so I feel well, it's not just an individual choice about do we want to use something because it feels convenient or it feels fun, but actually these technologies are profoundly impacting our, our society. And, uh, and mental health, I would think. Is there another question at the back? And then I'll get you. Yeah. Who's watching that? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's a really, really good point. And I think often what we hear with these, with these systems, and with all kinds of areas, whether it's like data collection or data sharing, often what we hear uh, for people who aren't concerned is that, well, we have nothing to hide, so we have nothing to worry about. And and that's a real position of privilege to be able to say you have nothing to hide. That that suggests that you're somebody who. Is, is not being discriminated against or is not at risk of persecution. Mm -hmm. And we have to think about how these systems that maybe we get benefits from or have enjoyment of are not equally beneficial for everybody. And the ways that they are being used are potentially having negative impacts for other groups. Uh, and also the point about privilege, uh, uh, the privileged position of having nothing to hide. Well, who knows in five years' time or ten years' time because who yeah. might have something yeah. to hide? Yeah. We've got another question right there. That's a, yeah. Maybe Ow. don't have an Alexa in the house. <laughs> Maybe turn off. Oh, uh, no, this is a really interesting bit. Um, recently, very recently, Alexa announced a, a new voice and a new persona. And this is partly to address uh, issues around um, gender, st gender stereotyping in smart devices. Um, and they created a new, more masculine-sounding voice for Alexa and a new wake word, which is Ziggy. Ziggy. Uh, Ziggy. And as, as a fairly obsessive David Bowie fan, I'm not sure how I feel about that, <laughs> but, but your friend could maybe get a Ziggy. You could maybe get a Ziggy. I think I would probably get a Ziggy. It would be a lot easier passport-wise. I'm just looking, you know, to make life easier. But a lot of people have got dogs called Ziggy. <laughs> it's going to cause a lot of trouble. Did I say another question over the... Sorry, there was a question at the front. Computer literacy. Yeah. yeah. Computer literacy. Um, I believe Finland gives classes in computer literacy thingy. I, I'm glass Swedish and I can barely manage English for <laughs> God's sake. You know, I'm doing really well up here, don't you admit? Um, but, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really important. And, and, and there's a lot of emphasis on kind of STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, and maths education. And a lot of a lot of attention paid to like how do we equip the next generation to move into career, careers in AI or build the skills to work with AI. But what is really important alongside that is that that's not just technical edu like education in kind of technical terms of being able to work with AI or work in AI careers, but it's also education about the ethical considerations and education about the kinds of decisions that we need to make about how we engage with these systems and how we use them. And education that really equips future generations to, to not just work with AI, but question AI and to challenge AI and, and to challenge the role that it has within our society. And one, I've got one final question that's come in from the online community. Um, is technology such as Alexa sexist in that it usually involves ordering a female to do all the work at home? Yeah. Yeah, and she can but get right cheeky back yeah. sometimes. This is a really, really important point. Um, and it's about what I said just about the new Ziggy persona is partly to address that. But up until very recently, all these smart assistants, they had female names, they had female voices, they tended to have female personas. Um, and with that, they tended to also be very... Uh, passive, subservient, you know, you can call them up at any time, they'll answer your query, sometimes mildly flirtatious in their, their response. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and there's been studies to show that this is really exacerbating kind of sexist attitudes within society. I'm going to do a little experiment, I hope we have time. I'm going to, um, sh how you react to this. Okay. How would you react if I called you a slut? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that is, that is, that I'm... <laughs> So this is something like a normal reaction. I was a bit nervous because you don't normally get a normal reaction. No, normally I punch you. <laughs> but um, in, in a study... But there's a recording. <laughs> in a study a few years ago, a UNESCO study, they, they looked at you know, how smart speakers respond to kind of abusive and, and insulting language. And, and in the study, they, they, it was Siri they were engaging with, and they called Siri a slut. Siri's response was not Susan's response. Siri's response was to say, and I, the tone of voice admittedly will be different, but Siri's tone of voice was, ooh, I blush if I could. Oh, no. 
<laughs> now, oh, that's much worse. I should have punched her, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that is not an acceptable response. And that is not, and again, thinking about how children are engaging with these technologies, we need these technologies not to tolerate no. abusive language, not to exacerbate sexist attitudes, but to, to challenge it. And actually, I would like, in my house, if my children are using Alexa, I don't want an Alexa which is purely subservient. Oh. I want Alexa to say to them, well, not in that tone of voice. Or to say to them, you can drop you that attitude, <laughs> young man. Yeah, only yeah. if you say the magic word. That's what I want Alexa to do. I don't want Alexa to and I'm be afraid, on hand. In this case, the magic word is time. Sorry, we're <laughs> right up against it. We could be here all afternoon. Thank, Thank you so much, Barry. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I've got the one in my car, the, the, the sat and I've downloaded a Southern Bell accent once. And I was driving to St Andrews at St Andrews. And then she kept going about the third round the bell, take the fourth on the left. <laughs> and she was so slow, I'd gone round the bloody round about twice before I'd managed to get the right one. So, ladies and gentlemen, our final performer for the Cabaret of Dinsight Ideas for the entire Fringe, actually. Let me hear a big round of applause. Michelle Harris and Cohen. Thank you. <laughs> Think about a relationship that is very important to you. It could be someone that you know or someone that you would like to know. I want you to think about what about that person? Why is it so important to you to have this relationship? And what is important to that person? Welcome to the Cabaret of Dangerous Ideas. My name is Shalhavit Simcha Cohen. You could call me Shalhavit or Simcha. And welcome to Can Networking Be Actually Fun? A little bit about myself. I'm a psychology PhD researcher musician. That means that I make really awesome, well, I take research on mental health and I make music videos and they're awesome. You should check them out. Harvard University thought that I'm cool enough and they gave me this award for my public service. And that means that I love you. I love people. There is one word that if you put at the beginning of an email, it could be at the beginning of the title of the email or the beginning of the commercial, that one word would make the most money online. So if you, yeah, that, that word would make people want to open the email. Can anyone guess what is that one word, the money maker? Help. Help, okay. What? Their name, very close. The word. Ooh. <laughs> people, people are interested when we're talking about them, when it's, when it's related to them, when it has to do with them. In fact, Dale Carnegie in his book, uh, Dale Carnegie is an American famous businessman, and he writes in his book ways that he approaches, the book is called How to Make Friends and Influence People. It's a New York bestseller. And he gives examples of letters that he writes to companies and how he approaches them. So he writes about the company, about what he likes about the company, and how he connects to their message and how he wants to help the company. Um, and that, is why I started with asking you about you and what's important to you. See, you like me already. <laughs> <laughs> Who here has been to summer camp? <laughs> summer camp, what is it called in England? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay, so summer camp is where kids go to for vacation. What do kids do here on vacation? Okay, so um, after curricular activities, <laughs> okay, so the counselors, Professor Ellen Langer from Harvard, she, um, she studies mindfulness. She defines mindfulness as noticing new things, um, basically not being in the, you know, all the time, you know, mindset and noticing new things. And she, she taught counselors at a camp to be mindful when they interview their campers. So one group, we're taught how to, how to be mindful. So notice new things about them, how their glasses are sitting on their face, maybe twinkle in their eye, how are they feeling? 
and the other group of counselors were just invited to ask to interview the campers. And then she went and asked the campers to rate and rank the, camp the counselors. The counselors that used the mindfulness tools were rated as more charismatic, as better people, and people that those kids would like to spend their summer with. And that's a very special summer. So it's interesting, when we, when we are curious about others, we come across as more charismatic. It's funny, we think that charismatic is like, oh, look at me. Actually, in fact, charismatic is when people feel affinity to you because they feel like you have something to do with them. So that's, I just taught you the secret for charisma. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, um, Professor John Goodman from University of Wisconsin-Madison studies happily married couples. And he distincts that, he makes a distinction that in marriages and relationships, there's a focus on validating each other, which is really important. And there's a focus on getting to know and being known, opening up and sharing, discovering, uh, and yeah, opening up. And he found that in those that stayed together for longer, there was a stronger focus on opening up and getting to know, so that you know the noticing new things and discovering um, creates more affinity. So I just taught you how to live <laughs> in a longer relationship. Um, so I invite you to take this on and try it. Maybe in the next, next time you reach to a company, maybe not this weekend, um, <laughs> maybe when you, when you see a friend or if you're going on a date, just try to be in their world, see what's important to them, notice new things about them, try to think how can you promote them, um, what are they dealing with, what, and, and really what do they stand for, acknowledge them for what do they stand for. It's, it's kind of calming to think about it because it's, it's really not about you. You could just relax and just be in the world of the other person and just discover what's happening there. And it's really fun. Networking could be fun in that aspect. Um, so how could I make your life more wonderful? I'm going to stay here for a Q&A. Um, but first, I really want to acknowledge you um, for coming here tonight. Your time and attentions are yours, and you share them both very generously with me tonight, so thank you. You just like me more now. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, you could find me on Spotify uh, or on um, shalhavi.com. That would work, too. Uh, my last words are be curious, be in their world, be courageous, and do it for other people. And remember... It's all about you. I mean, them. <laughs> the you. I'm gonna call you. I'm gonna call you Simcha. So let me just um, explain something. I am happily married. I have been married for 35 years. Um, I'm mainly. Thank you very much, madam. I am married mainly on grounds of vengeance. And because I can't really be bothered with the people who are involved in divorce. So, um, but if you look into somebody else's, if you take, uh, if you walk into somebody else's life and you look at, um, perhaps you might like them less. Because you might think, oh, God, these people are, they're not, they're not very empathetic. So are you suggesting that we should look for the niceness in people? Hmm. So liking them less has not much to do with them and, and more to do with you? No, 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 it's them. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I also acknowledge you for being so open and, you know, like when you said vengeance, yeah. there's actually another study um, by Daniel Kahn about how um, relationships that are more volatile versus conflict avoiders, the volatile stay longer. Um, so when we are <laughs> the vengeance... <laughs> What's this going on down here? <laughs> Nodding away there like one of those wee ornaments in the back of a 1970s Ford Fiesta. What's all this going on? <laughs> <laughs> Right. People who argue all the time and bicker are the ones who stay together. So we have a lovely kind of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So she did actually hit him quite hard at the end. <laughs> I was gonna write a song, I'm still working and it's called Conflict is Awesome. It makes relationship blossom. Actually when you share yourself, when if you're angry and you, you, you hold you don't hold it in, you actually share. Um, you, you 
you, you know, the person will get to know you and, and there's more chance to actually staying together versus... All right, okay, we've got agreement over here <laughs> on that. I mean, I mean I'm, we have been married for all these years and there's never been a crossword because I just don't bother to talk to him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and um, apart from any... Th why can men not move a wardrobe without emptying it? That's a big puzzle to me. And uh, there's knowing laugh at the back there. So, um, so you think... So actually, because what you... Because you see, you can't just step into somebody's psyche, can you? Because what you have to do is kind of ask questions and, and, look around, and so basically poke around in the attic, don't you? Mm. And so that means having really good communications with someone. It's not just noticing their glasses, is it, Simcha? You have to talk to them. It, it's talking. And yeah, it's talking. It's, I, I said it's being courageous. It's not, I didn't say it's easy. It's a lot of work. Now she tells me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he took me to a railway museum once and I'm not doing that again. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> It's just a holding tank for men in polo shirts. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's very, yeah. it's, it's, but it also, but you say it's about conflict. But um, I'll come back, there's a question online. I'll come back. You say it's about, you know, like, it's about really what you're talking about is actually avoiding conflict in the long run because you're trying to get to know that person better. Mm. Right, so... Yeah, it, I mean, even if you don't like their closet, right, or, or if someone comes to you and, and starts complaining, if you actually start thinking about what's important to them, it could make the conversation really interesting because they could like start complaining and you're like, what do they really care about? And instead of feeling attacked, you're actually like thinking about what's important to them. And you know, you might acknowledge them for like, oh my gosh, I get how important it is for you to be healthy. Um, and the conversation could really focus on what's important to them uh, versus the venting. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a new approach to making life. Uh, Ellen Langer, she invited us as students to sit sometimes in traffic and start noticing new things about the cars around us and what are people dealing with in the different cars. And the world becomes a museum. You know how kids kind of get so curious about everything and they're just enjoying the moment because mm. they're just mindful. They're just noticing things and we kind of you get into this pattern. So oh, yeah. I think you made a very interesting comment there. You said you just have to talk to people. Is that the same as talking with them? I see that is good because you, you yeah. said sit in traffic, be mindful, notice the cars around you. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I need a machine gun. <laughs> sure we all agree there, yeah. Mm. And what is she doing? You know, that sort of thing that that makes. So yeah, that's right. There's a very important difference between talking to and with. So mm -hmm. it's exploring their lives through a better, better standard of conversation. Yeah, I, I just like, it's being in their world, not in your world. It's kind of like, what are they dealing with? What's Suddenly it's not about you and you kind of relax a little bit and like you just it's entertainment in a way. It's kind of like watching a movie, like the world becomes so interesting. Oh, I must admit, I am a terrible people watcher. Is anybody else like that? A completely compulsive people watcher. <laughs> Has anyone else ever heard an argument on a mobile phone in English and swung around in the street and followed the people to find out what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Took me six hours to get back from Carlisle. <laughs> So you, it's, it's a matter, so the charisma bomb is basically not somebody going into the room and going, I am wonderful. It's the fact that they take the time to go round the room, or they take, so, you know, politicians are fiendish, some politicians are fiendish, not Mr. Trump, obviously, but uh, making people in the room thinking you're the only person in the room, is mm. that how they do it? So, I mean, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Like, I could come to you and be like, hey, I am so cool. Like, I'm really talented. And I'm really great, and uh, there are a lot of things that I love. Here's my business card, take a look at it. Or mm -hmm. I could come to you and be like, I was reading your article the other day, and I love what you wrote. I, I really like your style, I love what you're up to, and I really want to help you with what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> 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 um, Do I get the feeling he hasn't, hasn't heard that for a while? <laughs> In which case. You deserve that. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> so with a different approach, yeah, uh-huh. Many years ago, I was given a phrase, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Ah. Oh, altogether now. See, this is probably... No, 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 it's really lovely. That, but that is the essence of it, T teach people. Because another thing that I've noticed, which I think is really... Curious is I, I fell into the clutches of the NHS recently, and I discovered. Uh, is there anyone any nurses around? Hmm? Nurses for the NHS. In the club, well, it's a warm embrace the NHS, but you have to queue for six weeks to get there. And then, you know. um, but what I noticed was that nurses 
are eerie and code changing, switching between patients. So when they talked to me, it was all upbeat, da da da. Bah, bah, bah. Then when they were talking to old Mrs. Thompson, they were much more gentle and much more measured. And mm. it, it's because they are the ultimate carers. So in a way, are they instinctively doing what you're talking about? They're feeding into the psyche of the patient. I'm assuming, yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 they're kind of. It's really healing. Oh, I mean, my mom does Reiki. I don't believe in Reiki, but when she sits with me and just sits she with didn't me, mean that, I mom. feel better. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel better because she's giving me all this attention just for me. Uh, um, I think I think nurses are doing are practicing what you're talking about because they seem to pick up on people's personalities really quickly. They yeah. they they mirror your personality very very quickly, and you actually feel yeah you do like you're feeling. Good. I got thrown out the ward instantly because I was swearing at the chemo stand, <laughs> and they went yeah but we can only say that to you now fuck off. <laughs> That's the NHS caring for you. So how do we so we go about every day and what do you think a little exercise that we should do. What would you say? An exercise. This is a really cool one that we could actually do. That's um, I do that sometimes in business school where like I put people together and I give them an exercise that each one talks for three minutes and the person, the other person only listens. And there's like the three different levels of listening. One is just try to notice what the person is saying. The thing is like we usually think about what we're about to respond mm -hmm. and how can we contribute, <laughs> right? How can we fix? But one level, the basic is just notice what they're saying. The second level is try to gauge their emotions. What are they feeling? And the third one is try to notice what they stand for, like what's really important to them. Um, and yeah, so what, people do that in like three minutes each. There's a practice in San Francisco, it was founded there, where people do that for an hour each. Um, and exactly, it's madam. called cold counseling. Um, no, but I've got ironing to do. The three minute <laughs> practice, or, or you could just try it you know, in your next conversation. Just just do the noticing. But the three minutes each is, is really healing because we're really used to like that quick response. You'll either notice that it's hard for you to keep on talking or it's hard for you to just listen and not respond. Uh, but it's, it's a really great practice, I recommend. Okay. I think we get time for just one quick question. Yep. What do you do if somebody is mind-bogging and boring? <laughs> 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 Three minutes yeah. can be a long time, Simcha, if somebody is mind-bogglingly boring. Yeah. So mind-boggly boring means that, that it, it means that you are in a state of being bored. Yeah. And um, it, it may not sound so great to hear, but like you're being bored. They're being them. <laughs> you're being bored. And so you could, you know, if, if you start, try to notice something new about them, about yourself, I mean, if you turn it into like a learning experience, um, really, then then you, you like, <laughs> it's really like you won't be bored. But I have that. Um, I have a friend in the U.S. that every time I met her, she kept on complaining and complaining, and complaining, and complaining. Um, and then I um, I decided to try to notice new things. And I even thought ahead of time, what are new things that I know about her? And I was like, she's very generous. She's a mother. And so I came to the conversation and I already started thinking about what are the other things that I could see about her. And I came as like, I'm going to talk to someone who's very generous and a mother. And she just spoke differently. And it was in my listening. Now, I'm not saying that this is how you listen. You know, people tend to be people and sometimes we get bored. Um, and, and it's normal because we, you know, because that's, that's, what, that's what routine is. Routine is bored. There's a term in psychology, I'll end with that. It's called the exotic becomes erotic. When something is different, it's exciting. Oh. And that's why, you know, and that's research on divorce, right? That's why often divorce happens. We get used to things, so we get bored. Um, and the practice, my professor at Harvard would, uh, Tal Ben Shachar, he would, every week he would go on a date with his wife, leave the kids at home, leave the phones off, and, and, and do that practice of like discovering and try to find new things um, in that same person. Um, oh. <laughs> because yes, we are endless. I think that's what, yes, well, I think we'll, we'll put it. Oh, why isn't the world like you, Simka? Big round of applause, please, for Simka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to give, go, I want you to just give you a big hug, so I do, so I did. <laughs> oh, I'll come out, I'll pop out with it. Yeah, yeah, I'll pop out with it. Don't worry. Yeah, you can. Oh. <laughs> Three minutes to. Uh, I've been in a lift with my husband, and it was only four floors. <laughs> I had to keep looking at that insurance. Anyhow, um, thank you so much. Big round of applause there for our performance this afternoon. Thank you so much, Richard, Barry.
Thanks, Sean. Now, because this is actually a university uh, initiative, it's uh, universities in Edinburgh and, and further, and so we have we have a highly highly gauged technological evaluation that we have to carry out, which is on the piece of paper I am holding in my hand. So it's not that technical. So if you could just raise your hands and answer these questions, they're absolutely brilliant. Who's been to the Cabinet of Dangerous Ideas before? Yeah, yeah groupies. <laughs> I called you junkies, but I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. Um, who heard about it was online? Where's all our techno kids? Online, oh yeah, a computer, on a computer. <laughs> on a, yeah, on a computer. Alexa told you to come. <laughs> Who works at a university? Works at a university, university. It's my Glasgow accent, university. I'm not used to saying big words, right? We just say uni. <laughs> works. <laughs> Even Glaswegians got a trouble with that one. Who, who are friends or colleagues of the presenters? This is when they find out they don't have as many friends as they thought. <laughs> Sorry, Tim Chap. <laughs> Who's not from Edinburgh? Who, who are... Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, wow. That's... Uh, wow. Who is from Edinburgh, then? <laughs> yeah, well, shit, we are so outnumbered. I mean, are there any Glaswegians in? No, I'll have to start the fight myself, then. Right. <laughs> don't think I can't. Who's learnt something new as a result of this show? She's a slut. Um, <laughs> not that. <laughs> and who would recommend the Cabaret of Dangerous Ideas to a friend? <laughs> Woo! And sadly, uh, you can't because this was the last one. Uh, no, it's been a joy. It's been great. It's been great to be back. It really, it really is. And can I just say to all the people who have joined us uh, from, from outside of Edinburgh, who've travelled to come here back to this, the festival city, how delighted we are to see you again. Because we just, we do. We, there we are. We do. We love you. All the Edinburgh people will applaud you. Because we are. We're so glad to see you back. And anyway, we need your money. So... <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Cabaret of Dangerous Ideas for 2021. Really, kind of 2020. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy your weekend. And thank you once again for coming back to the city and back to the Stan Comedy Club. We'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>